right, so welcome back. We are at our final session for our fourth annual Suicide Prevention and Awareness Symposium hosted by Active Minds um, chapter of APUS. And I am what I'm proud to say we pull this off every year, despite whatever is going on around the world, in the country, mm -hmm. um, because mental health matters 24 seven, not just in May, not just in September. And we do strive to work to change the conversation on mental health and stamp out that stigma and everything that we do. And even though we're an online only chapter, we still um, have a fact around the world and I'm proud to be a part of this amazing group. So without further ado, we are going to have our wonderful advisor, Dr. Ratliff, um, introduce our other wonderful advisor, Dr. Cooper, for this final session. Thank you all for attending. Um, so I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for this last session, and it is Dr. Mel Mary Ellen Cooper. Um, she holds a BA in psychology, BA in music, MA in counseling, an MBA in business with a concentration in leadership, and a PhD in human services with a specialization in counseling. She is retired from private practice as a licensed professional counselor, what we call LPC um, in our language. Um, currently, she's a full-time professor for American Public University in the psychology department. Dr. Cooper is a human services board certified practitioner, a certified clinical hypnotherapist, and certified life coach. She's a proud chapter advisor for both APUS's Active Minds and Psychology Club organizations. And she also wrote a book called The Greeter. So welcome, Dr. Cooper. Oh, how sweet. Thank you for that introduction. And I hats off to you and Ree for all you do and all the officers for Active Minds. Y'all do a great job. And this is a huge undertaking. And I'm thrilled that I've had the opportunity to speak and close out the uh, symposium. It's been two wonderful days. And um, I, I want to say I'm last but not least because uh, y'all y'all chose me to be here and I'm proud of that. And I'd also like to um, just say that I have a special surprise, do, 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 a final request that Rhea's has given. So after I finish, I will stop and say if anybody has anything to say, and then I'll close out with the special surprise, the special request that I have uh, that Rhea's has given. So I'm going to uh, share my screen. Let's see, unless I close my screen. I think I did. Okay, give me a second. <laughs> You're good, Dr. Cooper. Just Somehow it, it went it, away. <laughs> you like you did before, close everything else, not your Zoom, and then hit share. Okay, give me one second. Talk amongst yourselves. While we're waiting, I will say that I put a resource that Dr. Ratliff shared last week, just in case you were unable to attend last week, uh, the pocket, the helper pocket card. I put that in the chat um, and then I will repost during Dr. Cooper's presentation, all of our links that I shared earlier. All right, and she's back. We can see it now, Dr. Cooper. Awesome. Um, what I want to talk to you today is about COVID and mental health, and I promise you, um, I was going to tell you a couple of things. Um, first thing you're probably wondering is those of you who don't know me, I'm from Georgia, so that question has been answered, and those of you who do know me, I'm still from Georgia, and today's uh, presentation, I've got the three B's for you. It's going to be brief, it's going to be brilliant, and I'm going to be gone. Um, and make sure you stay till the end because I got a special request from Reef for you. Today's talk I'm going to, to share with you is going to be about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you know me, and some of y'all who are online do know me, we're going to do that, but we're going to do it in reverse. Reverse, 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 reverse. 
we're going to talk about the ugly, the bad, and then the good. So let's start with the ugly. If you've ever seen a show that was called Dragnet, maybe you've seen it when um, it came on. Um, it was on uh, like Nickelodeon. Uh, there was a Dragnet show and they became famous for saying just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Well, what we're going to hear first is some research um, that I came up with that uh, looked at COVID and some of the things that came from mental health due to COVID. So you're going to see several screens that say according to. So according to some preliminary government data and uh, CBS News special reports and the CDC, um, the U.S. suicides dropped last year to find pandemic expectations. So a year ago when we had this uh, conference, um, I was, you know, we are, were all uh, looking at some very, very dreadful numbers. And the good news was that we didn't see suicide drop as much as we expected. So we're going to give a whoop, whoop out, everybody, whoop, whoop, yeah, 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 that's good. But as in all research, there's going to be, you know, good, bad, and the ugly. The number of U.S. suicides fell nearly 6% last year, and the coronavirus pandemic, the largest annual decline in at least four decades, the suicide rates have gone down. And that's according to these three particular sites that I took a look at. Okay, but there's still some ugly. There's a lot of ugly. In fact, what happened was we saw, according to the CDC, over 81 thousand drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States in the past 12 months ending in May of 2020, the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded in a 12-month period according to recent provisional data that was seen by the CDC. So we saw a lot of uh, prescriptions being written and a lot of overdoses that were um, street drugs as well as uh, prescription drugs. So were those overdoses on purpose? Were those suicides? Were they accidents? Um, perhaps we'll never know about many of them. According to one report that John Hopkins University did, we currently live in a gun culture. Um, as we've noted, he, they actually have a center and they actually have a, um, a, a surge of gun sales amid COVID-19 worries experts. That was one report that John Hopkins put out. They talked about, we have a perfect social group for increased suicide risk due to such factors that a lot of us have heard about um, in the symposium, social is isolation, anxiety, financial ruin. Daniel Webster, who is actually the director of that particular, um, uh, of the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Gun Policy and Research. He's actually one of the nation's leading experts in the prevention of gun violence. He says so many folks experiencing those sets of emotions and conditions have access to a gun. Um, I was telling someone the other day um, in coaching, they were talking to me about how can I prevent someone from uh, killing themselves with a gun? And I said, well, one of the most simplest ways is to remove all the guns from the house. If they're not able to have access to something, then it's going to be very difficult to um, actually do that. Um, guns by far are the biggest risk factor in completed suicides because they're so lethal, says Dr. Paul Nitstadt. He is a doctor and a psychiatrist. He's also the co-director of John Hopkins Anxiety Disorder Clinic. And he also um, gave an interview in, in this, in that article that I'm quoting now, the surge of gun sales and COVID-19 worries experts. If we go to gun.com, we can see that gun sales, they were very excited this year um, because um, the gun sales were the highest that they had been. And here is one of the articles talks about fueled by an estimated 8.4 million new first time gun owners suggested gun sales data climbed nationwide throughout 2020 and closed the year out with a record high. So the annual totals of 21 year history, um, as you can see here, suicides account for 60% of all firearm fatalities. And even before the recent run on guns, one in three US households already owned a firearm. Guns by far are the biggest risk factor in completed suicides because they're so lethal, says Paul Neistad from 
the uh, John Hopkins Anxiety Disorder Center. And if we take a look at the chart on the left, um, you can see over, over the years how the sales of guns have risen. Um, in 22, 2020, you can see that they were higher than they had been in four decades, in fact. We also know that in 2020, the fatality data shows that were increased traffic fatalities during the pandemic. And uh, the research, this particular research, states that risky driving behaviors, including failure to wear seat belts, speeding, and drinking while driving, identified as contributing factors. I thought this was a very interesting um, research um, along these lines because we know that there are a lot of people that were off the roads. We had less traffic. Um, not as many people were driving. Um, they were at home working or they, their job was being delayed for various reasons. So to have an increase in fatalities, it makes you wonder how many of those were also uh, suicides. But um, as we know, insurance won't pay for those. So perhaps some of those were actually due to suicides um, and a, a contributing factor to that would have been, or an underlying factor that would have, could have been um, insurance policies would still pay out. While Americans drove less in 2020 due to the pandemic, um, the early estimates show that an estimated 30, over 38,000 people died in motor vehicle traffic crashes. That's the largest projected number of fatalities since 2007. And this represents an increase of about 7.2% as compared to the 36,096 uh, fatalities that were reported in 2019. Um, I actually have a friend who is in charge of fatalities in a nearby county and he, he confirmed, he said, our fatalities are way up. And he, he even said, I think it's due to suicides, but um, we have to write them up as car accidents. Um, here's two charts. The first one shows um, how many people had contracted the uh, COVID during 2019, during the 2019-20 period, and how many deaths there were that were related to um, COVID. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in enormous losses in terms of human lives and economy uh, in the United States. The outbreak has been continuing um, to heavily impact mental health of people. And that's around the world, not just in our society. A survey conducted during the last week of March of 2020 actually showed that 72% of Americans felt that their lives were impacted by the outbreak, which was a 32% increase from the survey conducted only two weeks earlier. And the results show a positive correlation between COVID-19 infections, casualties, and a growing public concern. Now let's talk some about mental health. We know that a lot of businesses closed during uh, COVID-19, some permanently, some uh, just for a temporary period. Um, we know a lot of restaurants closed. We know a lot of restaurants switched to a lot of takeouts, a lot of deliveries, DoorDash uh, was up, um, services that deliver food was up. Uh, people started cooking in their homes and then inviting, I noticed on Marketplace, um, Facebook Marketplace last night, there were five people in my local area that were cooking tonight and tomorrow night and taking orders. And I even asked two of them, well, where are you located? And they said, my home. And uh, they said, I'll give you the address once you give me the order and uh, pay for your meals. And I'll just have them on my front porch and my husband will be there waiting for you. So I thought um, people have actually become creative in ways to uh, make money. Based on the University of Minnesota's research is an article entitled U.S. Job Losses Due to COVID-19 is the highest since the Great Depression. They also stated the number of jobs lost more than doubles the number seen during the 2007 to 2009 Great Recession when 8.7 million Americans lost their jobs. According to the USA Today article, of the 20.6 million jobs lost, 18 million of those are expected to be temporary when the pandemic recedes. According to the National Library of Health, there are multiple lines of evidence that indicate that the coronavirus disease of 2019, COVID-19 pandemic has prolonged psychological and social effects. Studies indicate that the COVID-19 pandemic is associated with distress, 
anxiety, fear of contagion, depression, and insomnia in the general population and among healthcare professionals. Social isolation, anxiety, fear of contagion, uncertainty, chronic stress, economic difficulties may lead to the development of depression, anxiety, substance use, and other psychiatric disorders and in vulnerable populations, including individuals with pre-existing psychiatric disorders and people who reside in high COVID-19 areas. So we could probably add to that list, you or you probably know someone that you could add, say, yes, they've had this, they've had that in the list, or you could actually add to that list of some other things that you've seen that affected them um, in the mental health area, either through your own uh, therapy work or maybe family or friends. We've seen that um, this, this particular article uh, that was published talks about stress-related psychiatric conditions, including mood and substance use disorders are associated with suicidal behavior. COVID-19 survivors may also be elevated suicide risk and the COVID-19 crisis may increase suicide rates during and after the pandemic. Mental health consequences of the COVID-19 crisis, including suicidal behavior, are likely to be present for a long time and peak later than the actual pandemic. So we're not really sure right now of what we're going to see long term. Um, I've talked to several people um, that have said going after being um, isolated, not going back to work. Now they're having problems going back to work, looking at people in the face or actually thinking while the other person is talking, are you real? Are you really standing there talking to me? Am I asleep? Am I, you know, do I really actually get to leave my house? So it's almost a question of, is this reality or is this fantasy, even in people that haven't presented any type of mental disorders before, could have had a lot of stress from the isolation and the uncertainty of what would happen during COVID. But since the coronavirus disease um, pandemic outbreak, many studies have demonstrated the significant proportion of people who test positive for COVID-19 have a new onset of smell or taste loss. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization and the National Public Health Authorities added new loss of taste or smell to the list of symptoms related to COVID-19. There is research out there talking about when and if taste and smell can come back, but it's inconclusive because there you probably know someone who has lost uh, their taste or their smell. And in doing so, it's not just losing your taste or smell, but that's part of your reality. That's part of uh, what makes us who we are. Uh, we no longer can walk into the kitchen or walk into a, a friend or mom's house and smell that apple pie that's cooking or you know, if we get a chance to go to the mall and smell that Starbucks coffee or smell those Cinnabons, um, which tr can trigger memories of being with your son or being growing up and your father took you. So those types of memories are not being triggered because we do have, uh, there are people who have lost their taste and their smell. Um, because of that, I want to talk about for a second, um, um, people who already have pre-existing uh, disabilities and mental disorders can actually, if you've ever worked with anyone who is schizophrenic or someone who had some type of psychosis, some type of paranoia, they already think that people, that someone is watching them or someone's after them, or they may think that the light in the room, uh, that there's a camera in there and they're constantly under surveillance. Well, with these factors of losing their taste or their smell, um, we found out over time before COVID that certain types of psychotropic drugs, um, some given to schizophrenics, can actually make them lose their sense of taste or change their taste to make food taste metallic. So the loss of taste or smell could actually not only uh, it could exaggerate some of the symptoms that we do see in, in folks that are already do have mental disorders, because I've even worked with folks before that, that start taking their prescription medicine and say, see, I told you someone's after me, someone's trying to kill me because I've that my, it, food doesn't taste the same, the texture's different and I can't smell. So that just shows someone's after me. And I try to convince them that you know, that it wasn't that you need to talk to your medical doctor, we need to, you know, set up a, a counseling 
uh, session to talk about these things and look at the research. So losing your taste and your smell is attached to a lot of different things. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll find something that's going to make the taste and the smell return, or hopefully over time, those who have lost their taste and their smell, um, that will return. Um, but those can actually aggravate um, not only someone who didn't have issues before, but someone who has some type of um, a mental disorder where um, that could be in question, paranoia could be in question. Let's talk about the good. So we talked about we talked about the ugly, we talked about the bad, and I will say that the ugly and the bad are subjective. Your bad may be my ugly, your ugly may be my bad, but they're still ugly and bad are still not so good. So uh, as Clint Eastwood would say, you know, there's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I'm gonna uh, roll on down into the good. So let's think about what happened that was good during COVID. Well, the earth got to relax during COVID. Um, they were able to reset. There was a lot of things in the environment that were able to reset. Um, some research shows that uh, the earth had an opportunity to build a clear blue sky again, to build clean air. Um, I can only imagine, I, I've heard soldiers talking about coming back from Afghanistan and, or different places and saying the, the, the earth, the weather was not good. It was uh, dark skies all the time. There was a black smoke in the air. My lungs are filled with black smoke. I'm, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be home. I'm, I'm glad I'm out of that environment. Well, the earth had a chance to clean up the air. And if we're breathing um, air that's not good for us, and that's going to affect us mentally, it's going to affect us uh, physically as well. So during the lockdown across the world, they, they got to see the sight of blue skies created a sense of optimism in people. Um, I've actually taught in China and in Vietnam before and uh, all throughout China, people would say, I have a question for you. And I would, I would think it would be related to school. And they say, Professor Cooper, they say there's a place that you live, you can see the stars at night. And I would say, yes, I can see the stars at night. And they say that in the daytime, you can see the blue sky. And I would say, yes, yes, there's places you can see the blue sky. And I remember one, uh, one of my translators in China even said, uh, my grandfather has told us of a time in China where he lived, he could see the stars at night and it was clear. And um, they tell us, he told us this because the environment is polluted now. And I said, pollution will block out the sun. It will block out the sky. And yes, that could be a, a definite problem. So the earth got to, to heal some what, and in turn that helped us to heal as well. Before COVID-19 all over the world, there was, you know, people were suffering from a high level of urban air pollution, especially from different forms of that pollution. And the major sources of pollution, such as transportation, industries, power stations, were responsible for this increased output of all those pollutants. Well, during COVID-19, uh, the majority of those sources did have to shut down. So although there's, there's the bad and there's the ugly, there was some good too. University of Houston did some research um, that found Hispanic and uh, Latino adolescents also had an elevated levels of mental health problems prior to the pandemic actually experienced a reduction in symptoms during the early ages of the public health crisis. Um, in this particular research, they talked about how they could sleep better. They talked about how they were able to actually felt like they felt better. And the University of Houston contributed part of that to families being home. They knew that uh, mom and dad or whoever the caretakers were, were going to be there. They didn't have to wonder what's for dinner. They didn't have to wonder about, well, um, are they going to be home at five o'clock? Are they going to be home at six o'clock? And so they actually saw a reduction in uh, the groups that they studied. But probably for in your own life, you got to see that you got to spend more time with your family or those that were in your home, or you got to actually got a chance to exhale a little bit. And uh, maybe you painted that room <laughs> that you have been planning to paint for a while. Um, and Fortune magazine reported that more than 110,000 eating and drinking establishments closed in 2020. Now, we don't know if that was permanently or if they're actually going to open back up, but uh, a lot of us learned about takeout. 
and a lot of us learned how to cook. I have to say I'm one of the ones that's probably more heavy on the takeout, but I am trying to learn to cook. Um, my idea of cooking is kind of pop tarts where you open the the envelope, you stick it in the toaster. I always say if it takes two steps, it's cooking. Uh, other, if it's one step, that's eating. So anyway, I think about, um, you know, a lot of uh, places, a lot of local restaurants were very thankful to get to, to when I would go and get takeouts and they'd say, thank you so much. Please tell your family and your friends to come and do our takeouts. This is the only way we're going to be able to survive. And so I felt like I was still helping the community and they were helping. It was a win-win situation as well. Um, so we learned about takeout. Uh, we learned that restaurants, and as I mentioned on Facebook Marketplace, uh, the ones that I've seen, and uh, you may be doing this as well, were cooking at home and then selling that. And I think that's something that we probably saw uh, several generations ago do. And we've, we're learning how to do that again as well. So that's been a good factor. We found books again. The libraries are changing and growing and helping our communities. They're doing curbside pickups. They're doing ebooks. I think it's wonderful to see that we found our books. We found music again. We see music stores that are struggling to get um, instruments out there. People said they could only see so much TV. They could only be on the internet for so long. They had to learn to do something. They had to read. They had to play an instrument. And I think we have to look to be positive. We have to look around us and choose to be happy. We see people who are happy around us. We see people who are sad. We see all kinds of negative things. We've been through two days of lots and lots of very, very sad situations, very sad stories. But I think in the end that we do have to look around and find out what, what sometimes you have to look at what's left and make that very positive. And I found um, a reading that I always think about when times get tough. You have to think about uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians in 4.11. He says, not that I speak in respect of want. But I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therefore, to be content. We're all going to have yin and we're going to have yang, but we have to find a good balance of those. And that's my good, the bad, and the ugly. And if uh, Re or anyone has anything else to say, and then I have my special surprise to close. Hi, Mary Ellen. So something that you said that I, I kind of want to um, piggyback on a little bit is I noticed you mentioned positive and I, I think of it as finding hope. Yes. So that rather than like happiness and positive, because I think sometimes when people say find the positive, it ignores the fact that there are real emotions that are sad. Yes, there are. Uncomfortable. There are. And, and sometimes um, that can force people to internalize that instead of processing it you know so I kind of look at it for where do we find the hope in the situation rather than where do we find happiness because happiness yes. is just a uh, it's, it's it's out there and yes happy is is a real feeling but I think sometimes people get lost in finding that and so if we can just cling on to some sense of hope and yes. that that's really where where it is so I, I, I think that's a that's happy. a very good analogy I think about Winnie the Pooh because he says Sometimes, um, sometimes I can't change my attitude, so I change my shirt instead. So I think he focuses, to me, that says he's focusing on something else. And you, it, you, it's like changing the channel. Um, so like you said, you have to find your own hope. I like that. When you can't change your attitude, <laughs> change your shirt. Um, <laughs> 
Right. You change what you can. Right. right. Uh, Go for a walk, change your environment. Yeah. So um, I heard you getting choked up. You're choking me up a little bit, but I love the authenticity and the sincerity um, in the presentation. I wanted to say poor Dr. Ratliff read my bio and I have a quote from Hamilton in there on purpose. <laughs> and, you know, um, when he says, you know, I'm the one thing that I can control. And yeah. so that, that really is like a life motto that I have. And I also try to teach my son that like when he's like, God, oh, this guy makes me mad and I just want to hurt him. When I hear him saying that, I know it's a very natural thing, especially if you're a protector. Yes. But then when I tell, you know, Isaiah, yeah, well, if you want to go to jail, go for it. Or you could work on what you can control, right? Yes. Which is emotion about the situation and take a step back. And so all that kind of stuff, um, focusing on the good is a choice, right? Or we can focus on the law. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think okay. what's touching to me is we are seeing people read again and turn to music and do things like that. We kind of lost that. And that Absolutely. to me is very special. Over the years, I, I went to different live events and see a standing room only crowd to see, to going from that to seeing hardly anyone there. And then I think now that um, we are seeing events again, we're seeing more and more of that. And we're also seeing the libraries come back, which is exciting. Yeah, so I was sharing in the chat. Um, I'm like, check your local library. If your local library isn't awesome, use ours because San Antonio Public Library has a very robust um, online life as well. And they yes. really stepped it up over the quarantine and they continue to have them Yes, um, because I think what we learned during this pandemic quarantine is uh, uh, some people can't get out there and do stuff, but they can stay connected through yes. virtual events, you know? So I think yes. The good, the bad, and the ugly, like you were sharing, some of the good is, despite it being virtual, some people are way more connected now. Yes. And one of my other favorite turns has been, I've seen so many folks um, who are grandparents, maybe, who live across the country, and before, they never got to see or talk to their kids and grandkids, but now that nobody can go anywhere, now they have, you know, weekly Zoom or FaceTime chats with their family that they didn't have before because yes. no one had the time. Yes. So I think that kind of stuff is so good for our mental health as well. And to include us, we, we um, meet with my family up in Alaska about once a month just to see each other's faces because why not? Yes. <laughs> yes. Right? Why not? Right. right. So, all right, let me check the chat. I thought there was a question. I want to bring one other thing up to you, if, if that's okay, <laughs> if we have time and space, um, is that in at the very beginning, I don't know if anyone on this um, call um, experienced this, but at the beginning of the pandemic, if you were a parent and trying to help your children with school stuff, and you were working full-time from home, and you were trying to juggle everything, there was a moment of real frustration with people saying, oh, I'm baking bread now, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I was just like, oh, I can't do any of that. I'm really, I'm in a space where I am stretched. I'm trying to help my kid with their schoolwork. I, I see you nodding, Ree. <laughs> um, and so, so just being mindful that, um, you know, all of the coping skills and all of the, the things that we do, you know, in, in that regard, um, that the pandemic threw us in a situation that, that some of us were so stretched that it was even harder to build in some of those routines that we normally had. Um, and so I didn't know if anyone else experienced that in the beginning. I think it's, we've kind of settled in now and kind of gotten in a rhythm, but, um, but yeah, that was my initial reaction was, okay, that'd be awesome if I could just stop and bake bread, but I can't, I don't have time. I don't have time to garden. I don't have time to do yeah. that. Or are there people suddenly losing weight because now they have time to exercise? Well, good for you. Um, and there was like the little <laughs> devil in me that was like, maybe it's because you lost your job and now you have time. Well, lucky you, you know? <laughs> and then I had to remind myself to be thankful that I had a job. And even though I'm stuck at a computer and I don't get to go exercise because I don't have all this extra time, right. um, you know, to again, be thankful for what I did have, because I'm telling you that witch in me was really, I had the claws <laughs> out. I was so frustrated 
with that, right? And it's people expressing their positivity. And meanwhile, I'm over here hating because that's where my heart was. And I had to check it. So I, yeah. I yeah. hear you. I will say I was thankful to one God and every God that I did not have a toddler. And God bless those people who, in addition to everything we just mentioned, also had babies, but more importantly, mobile, like one, two, three-year-olds. I just couldn't imagine. Yeah. I could not do it. <laughs> so yeah. anyway. I just wanted to voice that and bring that out because I know sometimes when I'm in these presentations and everybody talks about all the, the great, you know, coping things that they were able to do, um, you know, just acknowledging that it, it, was, it it's been tough at moments. Um, depending on where people are. It's kind of that image of, you know, we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. You know, I kind of think of that image that, you know, um, instead of being, we're all in the same boat, we're all in the same storm. Yes. But just in different boats (laughs) experiencing that storm. Yeah. Well, did you get to keep walking? Did you get to, I guess you couldn't do any of your um, uh, five K's, but did you keep walking and exercising during that time? Uh, not completely. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of pause, uh, Mary. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, a lot of the races, all of my races were canceled. So it was just a lot of pause. Yeah, I'm and just reshifting things. So yeah. All right, Rhea, you ready for your special surprise? <laughs> your request? Go for it, ma'am. Anybody else had anything to say? <clears throat> okay. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am, I'm ready for my surprise. Go for All it. All right, Let's here it. it comes. Here it comes. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. Be all right now, be all right now, be all right, be all right. Be all right. You've been waiting all year to hear that. <laughs> I love you so much. Thank you so much. It makes my heart so happy. And I know you don't have to do that, but you do it. And, um, ugh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I you. wish we could have weekly dates. That's what I want. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> All right. Do we have any other questions? You got a lot of woohoos, awesome, sing it, twenty fools. <laughs> um, love it, love it, love it. Uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Cooper before we close out here? Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> I love it. Um, I did want to speak to uh, Dr. Ratliff's comment about same storm, different boat. Um, I have seen a pretty cool visual of that as well. And I think it's very powerful. And um, just in, you know, alluding back to Dr. Lulu's presentation and, and Dr. Adewale's about the different struggles that different people have. Some people might be wholly incapable of even empathizing with because they are blissfully ignorant or they legitimately just don't understand um, how life can be heavier for people who aren't in their seat of perspective and privilege. And um, privilege, by the way, I just wanna make this note clear because I think it's important, especially when we're talking about mental health. Um, When people say privilege, people hear white privilege, and I think that's unfair. White privilege is just one aspect of privilege. The fact that you have a home is a privilege compared to some. The fact that you have a job, like I talked about earlier, is a privilege compared to some. Um, The fact that uh, you might have three meals a day is a privilege to compared to some. And so just remembering that, honestly, as Americans, um, we are in a seat of privilege simply by the passport we have access to. And the fact that uh, you can find shelter, you can find food in this country. And that is not a thing everywhere you go. And it's not even a thing for everyone here in America. So just try to remember that. I think um, try to be a place of support and love and not of judgment or, well, if I can do it, you can do it. Um, 
And I even remember Judge Huff said that last week, and she even comes from a place of when, you know, when she's coaching her mental health court um, folks, what she, what she means by that is you can also do it too. Um, but I do caution folks when they say, well, if I can do it, you can do it because it can be, it can be um, heard as a dismissive, well, you're not trying hard enough. And of course, we don't want to send that message either, especially in the mental health advocacy um, world that we are in. And I just want to send a personal thank you to each and every one of you who are either here now with us live or might watch this recording later. Uh, we do put a lot of work into coordinating this each year. And like I said, we don't let anything stop us. We did it last year and depth of the pandemic and we will continue to get together to do what we can to change the conversation about mental health normalize it um you can talk about your broken foot you can talk about your broken heart and you can talk about your broken brain if it's broken uh you can talk about your hurt emotions just like you can talk about your hurt heart and your hurt hand and i think it's important to also talk about um you know, some people take medicine for headaches, some people take medicine for high blood pressure, and some people take medicine for um, a mood swing that they might have. And there should not be that stigma that seems to permeate anyway, is maddening. So um, as not only a mental health advocate, but also a disabled person advocate, I invite you to remember that uh, not everyone's story is yours, and that's the beauty of different people and to just find um, value in others and let them know that you value them. I think that's just as powerful. So here at Active Minds, we say you matter um, because you do. And that's our chapter kind of motto. And then of course, need you here is equally as true. And that is the national, um, the national kind of hashtag and also here for you. So as uh, wonderful Olivia shared with us earlier, you don't have to be a professional like some of the doctors here online. You can just be you. And remember, if someone is coming to you with possibly a deepest, darkest secret they've never shared with anyone, or if they're coming to you because they just don't know who else to turn to, remember that that is another seat of privilege that you're in, the honor that they would come to you. And you have the... Um, the trusted seat of listening. So I just invite you to remember that it's not your job to fix people and you probably don't know how anyway, but the great and human thing to do is to just be there, be present, um, probably with your mouth closed and your ears open. That's always a great place to start. Um, and if you don't know what to say, it's okay to say that, right? If you don't know what to say, but you want to be supportive of someone, then that's what you can say. Thank you so much for sharing with me. I don't even know what to say, but I'm so glad that you trusted me to share this with me. It's a great place to start. So with that, unless anyone, those are my closing thoughts. <laughs> if no one else has any questions or comments or um, anything else, I'm going to officially close the symposium for 2021. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right, Ms. Chef, you can go ahead and end the recording. Thank you all for coming today.